Hello there, human beings. What I love about Zoom is that we don't get a countdown, which means you just sort of like drop into Zoom. So here we are. Hi, Hi Matthew, Jessica, Jessica, Matthew. We are doing a little interview today. How are you doing today, Jessica? I'm okay. It feels like a little, a little fragmented. Another day. What am I supposed to be doing? Right. <laughs> I think I feel that every day. At this point. <laughs> so what are we doing now is actually the real question. So I brought Jessica online to have a little chit chat with me about a few things. Well, let's talk about what those things are. One, we're going to learn about her business so we can find out what she does. Two, we're gonna find out how Jessica is responding to the state of affairs. And then three, we're gonna talk about money. Money, money, money. Make so money. money, 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 money. Right, exactly, all right, cool. So Jess, who are you, my dear? That seems like a loaded question. <laughs> I mean, it is a loaded question. It's the best yeah. question, right? So let me, let me reframe that. What do you do as a profession? Let's, let's start there. Um, as a profession right now, I am the owner of a Pilates studio and I teach private and semi-private and now group online sessions um, of Pilates. And I teach classical Pilates and I also do a little bit of yoga, teach yoga. And that's basically what I do. I like to empower people through embodiment practices. Cool, awesome. Now, Jessica and I know each other through the world of dance. We went to school together at Goucher, as they say, if it's French, it's not Goucher. It's Goucher. Goucher, um, which, uh, which is just a, a you know, small liberal arts college in uh, Northern Baltimore area, Towson specifically. So we know each other through dance, but I'm kind of curious. How did you, well, I kind of know the answer, so I'm not gonna say, but how did you get involved in Pilates and why did you choose that as your path? Um, so simply, I, Pilates was a cross-training avenue for me. And um, at the end of my senior year, I thought about what do I want to do? Am I, do I still want to dance or do I want to go into research and psych and or go to graduate school and I really wanted to continue dancing professionally and as you know uh, the arts aren't super valued here and don't make much money so Pilates felt like a natural compact business I could take around and have with me wherever I go it's a skill I could use to make money as a dancer. So yep. that's why I chose to be certified in Pilates. Yeah, yeah. And so you brought up money, which is an interest and in like the arts world, which we're going to talk about in a second. But before mm -hmm. that, you also mentioned that you said, and, and now online classes. So I want to acknowledge that, right? And, and really maybe share a little bit about the transition you're making with your programming now that we're in this new environment where people can't go currently go to the Pilates studio. Um, yes. So, well, I'm based in San Francisco. I don't think I mentioned that, but, um, how have I transitioned my business? What's going on? Like what? Yeah. What are you doing now? Like how, how, how are you responding to the fact? Cause normally you'd have like group classes and you've got the reformer and the big machines yes. and you, you, you don't have those machines. You're not actually touch you, a lot of it was hands on, right? So you're not yeah. actually able to like touch and be tan like tactile that way. So, so how are you adapting to this um, new, new normal? So I am teaching online live classes through zoom. And I teach a couple of group classes and I'm still teaching a few private classes. Um, and the way that I do that, because it, this feels too small for me to be like on a laptop or something, tiny little screen. So I um, figured out how to cast, which is like make this screen onto a giant television 
so that I could see more clearly more people, but also when I'm looking at my clients specifically, I can see their alignment and make corrections. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's something that I'm super happy about and that I, I don't see a lot of people doing. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got these tiny little screens and they're just doing classes with the clients. And I really look at, look at people uh, and make corrections and, I still get my rights and my lefts confused. I think that will always be an issue, but um, that is, that's kind of what I'm doing. So I'm just trying to teach people online and they work out in their homes or on their patios or I think that's all I've had so far. Hmm. Patios and living rooms and bedrooms. Hmm. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So you're you have equipment. Some people do have small equipment, like little chairs that are portable. So that's exciting when I can. Yeah. Good. Good. So you're so you're adapting obviously to this new way of working, and and it's it seems to be working. I mean, it's you know I know that maybe that was like speed bumpy a little bit, or yeah, right. Click click click. It's it's working. It's still I'm still finding my way and trying to find my groove and. I definitely am adapting. Like I love the fur babies that come in and the real children that come in. And sometimes I'll involve the children. Hey, can you do me a favor? Can you like sit on your mom for a second on her back while she's in child's pose? Can you just like touch this and make, yeah. So that's really, that's really fun to get the kids involved. Yeah, if only the cats would follow the instruction as well. <laughs> That's don't don't listen to anybody. All right, so so going back to something you said earlier, you decided that Pilates was sort of a way for you to direct out of, not necessarily direct out of, because you were still involved in the dance world, right? I mean, you didn't just like go from like, I'm stopping dancing, I'm going to Pilates, but there was sort of a transition. But it also sounds like, and maybe I'm making this up because I know you, but it sounds like um, it was like a a, a a comparable or a, a synergistic career choice, right? A way to make money because, you know, yes. you, you are making money in the arts, you're making enough money to be poor, right? To be fair, to be fair. Um, what, so what, what, what's, and now you're a business owner. Now you're an entrepreneur. Now you're like, you know, you're, you, and you, you've been, how long have you been running that Pilates studio? My brick and mortar place has been for six and a half years. Got it. Okay. Um, in San Francisco, and prior to that, I was just an independent contractor. Got it. Um, starting in Maryland, where we met, and then moving to San Francisco at different studios here. Yeah. Okay. So, and so, and so now you're taking on this sort of, or you've taken on this mindset of a business owner, and you're, you know, you're you're doing the work, but you know, with business comes managing the money. Right. So I'm sort of cu curious, like, what is your relationship to money? Like, wh where are you at? Is money your best friend? Is it your secret lover? Is it like that, like, you know, college, I don't know, like that college roommate that pukes on your, you know, bed? Like, like, who is money to you? What is your relationship to money? Um, well, I have to say that, well, okay, first of all, just to to backtrack, this business in the time of the global pandemic that we're seeing has brought up my least favorite things about being a business owner. I hate dealing with the finances, filing for taxes, organizing that sort of thing, marketing, being online. I don't like technology. That's why I work with people. I like touching people. I like connecting with people. And actually it's also been my saving grace, like, because I can connect with people, you know, it is a way to connect, um, live. So that being said, my relationship with money, um, is that I have this belief that I have a couple of beliefs. One is that I always have money for the things I need and want to do. Like I always have faith that it's there. And two, that I'm irresponsible with money and that I just 
don't have a lot of awareness. Like if you ask me how much money is in my bank account right now, I have no idea. I mean, I have an idea because I've been looking at it more and more lately. Um, but savings, 401ks, planning, that sort of thing. Um, I didn't grow up in that kind of uh, home environment. My mom was a social working single parent with three girls. And I often like, how did you do, how did you survive as a social worker? Like, and she's like, well, you guys were always on scholarships. We didn't have any animals. We never went on vacation. Da, 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 da. That's how we did it. And I was like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah. So I guess my relationship with money is I like to avoid it and yeah, it's, it's like, um, I don't know. It's like something that's constantly knocking on my door, mm. especially living in San Francisco. I live in one of the most expensive cities in the United States and, um, it just feels like if I look at it, then I won't be able to do the things that I want to do. It's like kind of a procrastination thing. It's uh, yeah. I yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Um, hmm. Why? Well, I, I feel like I so I relate to a lot of that. Um, and I think everybody's relationship to money. Well, my my relationship to money has clearly been defined by my childhood. Obviously, most of us. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. I don't know who would be exempt from that per se, right? Um, yeah. Because the because there's also things that are influenced by money that aren't talked about, right? It's like, you're like, you know, this whole thing about your parents not going on vacation. Well, that was a money decision. You didn't know it, but it was a money decision. And now, and it meant something and then it created something. And it's like, and then that played its way out and in, in, somehow in like how you experience or relate to money. Um, and I think what's um, curious for me is how, so I've been doing a lot of research recently on money mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, cause I, I grew up in a, a, a low income family. Um, and I grew you know, like food stamps, single parent, you know, um, I remember one of my, er one of my earliest memories of money was like finding money on the side of the street and being like so excited about it. And then like me and my three brothers and my mom went to this corner store and I, and we bought water guns and candy. That was like what I remember. And I was like, okay. In hindsight, I look at that. I'm like, why did we not buy groceries, right? So, but, which to be fair, like maybe that was actually, she did buy groceries. I just didn't relate to the grocery buying part of it. I related to like, oh, you know, we found money. We can go do something fun. And it's like, okay, that's interesting though. Cause then that, what that creates is like, I know that I don't buy things for myself. I don't. I mean, I do, I do, like I, I, you know, but I, 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 like the last pair of shoes I bought, I don't remember when it was, which is not a good thing to be clear, because shoes wear out and I understand that, but I see that as like, well, it's a luxury to buy a shoe, or a pair of shoes, it's a luxury to buy, you know, I bought, I bought some um, crystal pendants the other day, I was like, we should, you know about that, you were, you were there with me. And because, um, P.S., we have a money buddy collaboration, <laughs> Jess and I. We get, and once a week, this is a tip for all of you, once a week, we block out an hour, we get together either on a Friday or a Saturday, we declare at least one money goal for that hour. It could be something as simple as like, you know, reviewing our bank transactions, um, doing some cash flow projection, like whatever, sending an invoice, like whatever it is, you know, but it works. It's helped me. Has it helped you? I mean, it's the only way I'm looking at my money. <laughs> Done. So it's helping you, clearly. Yeah. I wouldn't do it if I didn't have a partner. Yeah, exactly. So we have... That would be awesome. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. But I bought those pendants in that hour. And, and it was actually a big deal for me because it was like the first time that I bought something that I felt recently, that I felt, felt was actually something for me. Mm. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Um, so interesting. I don't, I live kind of a luxury, luxurious lifestyle. I'm not like a shopaholic or anything, but. <laughs> yes, queen. But, I love it. but I never would be, 
I would go out to eat and I would and spend money at nice restaurants and spend lots of money money that I don't have uh, on credit on credit money I don't have or I you know for my birthday last year I bought myself jewelry and I was like interesting so interesting well it brings up go ahead yeah no so there's like a little bit of weird cognitive dissonance there that feels well, it, weird <laughs> yeah it's like it's the line between needing and wanting and I feel like you get you, you know if if you if you're taught to not want things that you don't need then you like that me i was taught to not want things that i don't need that's how it occurred for me so then i really started to question well do i need that or do i want that and it got to the point where it's like well well literally what do i need i need a roof over my head i need shoes on my feet i need clothing to wear i need you know i need the basics and anything above that, i.e. a new pair of shoes, though it might be nice, it's not needed, right? right. And so it created this like squashing of, okay, well, here, here's the little box of things that are actually needed. And, and I'm grateful for it because, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful to have, I'm grateful to have things that I don't need Right. I'm, I'm present to the fact that people don't have certain things. Like but so it's created like a sensitivity and awareness to, to needing versus wanting. But then the result of that is I'm just not sometimes I don't buy things that I want to take care of myself. Like, like, like there's a self care component component to wanting something like I want. I want a great relationship for myself. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah, I might settle for a, 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 a shitty relationship or, or because I need a relationship, right? But no, actually, you get what I'm saying? Like, you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, no, actually, you don't, you don't need a, sh a, a shitty relationship. You need a great relationship. You want an amazing relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's this dynamic between, like, and, 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 and it all comes down to money. Like, it all in some weird warped way in many ways for me comes down to our relationship to money and like what like how do we like what energy do we associate with it what what quality does it have in our life like what impact it does it create has it created in our family and how do we carry that with us as we grow but but i'm, I'm curious more so about how we change that conversation how we shift that conversation so i guess my question for you you know, your, your, your business is changing, things are moving, you're looking at your, your, I know you're looking at your own business thinking like, how do I want to be in the future, right? And as you make that shift for yourself, what are some of the things that you're questioning about your relationship to money? Like, is there anything that you're like, hmm, I used to think this, or I used to do this, but actually... I'm wondering this, or I'm curious about that, or I'm, or I'm maybe, or maybe it's like a new practice that you're, uh, or a way of being with money that you're exploring. Is there anything like that that's going on for you right now? Um, well, I think because I've never had a, a consistent monthly income, mm -hmm. that's also part of the reason I avoid, because a lot of people, they have like, okay, I have $4,000 coming in every month, my rent is this much, my da 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 da. And then you can really see very clearly black and white how it goes. But having a business as an entrepreneur that's service based, like there are ebbs and flows of money. So I was always um, reluctant to have a budget. And I was like, I don't know how to budget. Um, you know, I'm almost 40 years old and I don't have a budget. So looking at like what it is I actually need to survive like going through my yearly statements, going through, you know, my yearly income, dividing by 12, like how much do I average on month, on per month basis, those kinds of things. Um, I don't know, last year was the first year I paid quarterly taxes, like, which was amazing. And this year I've been paying my quarterly taxes. So I feel like I am at a place where I am starting to actually see money's role in my life to mm. actually look at it. So I, I'm at a place where I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm single. I live by myself. 
in a very expensive city, how, how do I make choices? Um, and how will I shift? I'm, you know, contemplating a new business model or how do I set my pricing? How do I, oh, is, it's based on Amy's down the street. Well, Amy's Pilates studio is fully owned. She owns the building. She blah, blah, blah. She doesn't actually need to make money. Amy's partner is a tech person who's making fuck tons of money. And so she doesn't even have to think about it. And so she's just, she has an arbitrary amount and I have this amount. And so looking at what it is I need to survive, really looking at all of that kind of stuff. So my, yeah, my relationship to money is I'm just starting to actually um, look at it. Mm, good. Less afraid, being less afraid of it. Yeah. Even because I feel like there's all this um, kind of feelings that come up with money, like like the stuff that you're talking about, like, do I need this or do I want it? And I and those feeling guilty about purchasing things or just being like, I'm such an irresponsible piece of poo poo because I didn't, you know, I'm not being responsible, whatever, or I'm re- irresponsible because of this, it, the shame around it, yeah. like the feelings and the, sh- the, the crap. Yeah. So, well, I, I get that too. I feel like, um, I feel like the word that comes up for me is greed. Like it's not good to be greedy. And if you want money, then you're greedy. Mm. I mean, like, and I don't want to be greedy because that like, greedy is bad. And so therefore I don't want money. I'm like, whoa, okay, that doesn't work, right? You, like, it's like a yeah. um, view or relationship. And it's not that money is, money is bad. And greed doesn't only come in the form of, of hoarding money, right? right. So, so, but what happens, it's like they get in our minds as kids or as whatever, as we, they, we collapse these things and then they become fixed as like, oh, they're the same. And so then it like, that becomes how we operate, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Until we learn to uncollapse, right? Yeah. Um, so Jess, thank you for exploring and swimming with me in a conversation about money and your business and what's going on. And I want to acknowledge you for just being open to talking about it because honestly, I think a lot of people aren't actually talking about money. They're not having the conversation. They're not being open. You know, I think the other thing that happens with money is shame and hiding. It's like, oh, I don't want people to know that I don't know how, or, or that I don't want people to know that I have this bill. I don't want people to know that I can't afford this house. Or I don't want people to know that I can't, that my business isn't doing as great as it looks. You know what I mean? There's like all these like reasons for hiding, right? I think, so that's like a huge thing for me, like that, the hiding, the shame, but also just the feeling of um, worthiness. It brings up this this feeling of your sense of worth and it's just like Mm. i had a client before this happened said when are you gonna raise your rates and i was like just like this just seems like you you offer me so much and i pay so much more to people who offer me like less than what you're offering so when and she's like and don't tell any of your other clients i said that but but that felt really good, but it's also like when you have a service, it's like, how much am I worth? And when you have your own business and you're an entrepreneur, it's like, how much am I worth? Like, how much is my time worth? It's like, and those lines get kind of blurred between you and your business because I am my business. Like I, right. And that feels weird. So, um, so worth and worthiness, I think, are like also into that mix of like the shit storm that gets churned up when we talk about money. And damn girl, it is just one hell of a storm <laughs> up in here, <laughs> like a money storm. <laughs> and, and somehow you got to turn that into a hair flip, right? Word. All right. Well, yeah. those okay. of you who are uh, watching this, thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning. So I want to announce two things. One. This Thursday, I have, with a good friend of mine, Emelina, a talk about money in the arts world. 
it's an arts meets biz conversation. We're gonna do a whole unconference thing and break down the conversation a little bit through some breakout rooms and then give you an opportunity to sort of digest, process, think through, gain another level of understanding and really shift your relationship to money, particularly if you're an artist. Another thing that I've got going on next week with a friend of mine, Margo, is a, um, it's called PB&J, Your Way to Stronger Cash Flow. So whereas the first one is more about for individual artists, arts organizations going through transition, want to change your mindset around money or creative entrepreneurs, this conversation is more for the business owner, the entrepreneur that wants to understand how to price their work effectively, budget their cash flow so that they can make it through what they're trying to make it through and ultimately justify the growth expenses that will be needed to, to actually turn the dial on the next chapter of the organization. So if you're curious about either of those workshops, I'm going to post the details below. And uh, it sounds like I need both of those, those workshops. Oh girl. Hey, you know what? <laughs> you, you are perfect perfect where you're at and fortunately we're money buddies so i got you girl it's all good all right thank thanks you. for being my money buddy <laughs> all right bye bye